Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I would like to warmly welcome uh, Serka Honen, uh, our distinguished uh, guest. Uh, came all the way from Finland. Uh, we highly appreciate that uh, Serka uh, uh, offered also uh, a lecture. Apart from uh, this lecture today, we are cooperating with her on uh, a development of uh, an educational portal uh, that should deal with uh, uh, history of uh, Czechoslovakia, the communal history of Czechoslovakia, uh, as contested history and as an experience with the uh, communist regime of state socialism, wherever uh, uh, it's aimed uh, at uh, especially the Western audience. So uh, it will be in English and we. Uh, uh, are grateful that uh, she's uh, willing to uh, help us uh, not only with the uh, uh, conceptual part but especially with the didactics. So, uh, Sir Kahlen uh, 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 made a, a stark, uh, starting uh, a career, uh, at both academic but also educational one. Uh, she, uh, for most of her life, she uh, was a, a lecturer, uh, a, a professor at the uh, University of Helsinki, uh, where she is now a professor uh, emeritus, uh, but she has also done a number of things uh, in the field. So when it comes to her uh, latest book, uh, Coming to Terms uh, with the Dark Past, how perfect. Post-conflict societies deal with uh, history, published in 2012 by uh, Peter Lang. Uh, this doesn't uh, rely uh, just on uh, theoretical findings or uh, uh, a distant approach. She has spent uh, uh, more than a year, uh, two, years. two years, okay, uh, uh, two years uh, uh, lecturing at a college or secondary school uh, in Mostar uh, in 2000s. Uh, and she was working uh, for a number of years for uh, Europeo uh, and uh, what I especially like uh, is her uh, a number of her articles that uh, connect uh, memory studies, uh, uh, public history uh, and education. Uh, so uh, maybe my favorite article is from 2001, uh, Politics of Identity. Uh, to historic uh, curriculum. Uh, curriculum uh, narratives of the past uh, was uh, uh, published in Journal of Curriculum Studies and I highly recommend uh, her other works as well. Uh, today uh, she's going to talk about politics of memory tracing a post to their turn uh, which uh, departs from her earlier uh, post-conflict focus a bit. Uh, and it's especially aimed at, uh, let's say, our region, if I may say so, Central and Eastern Europe, uh, and, let's say, post-Soviet camp. Uh, so, uh, uh, I look forward uh, to this focus and uh, its potential uh, for uh, our self-reflection as uh, an institution, uh, but also uh, at the debate, because she's going to uh, speak a little about uh, her conceptual, uh, methodological, theoretical approach uh, to, uh, uh, her, uh, uh, to her uh, uh, study of this uh, particular region and of its uh, social uh, public memory uh, and its place uh, in the uh, whole frame of the historical uh, so please, uh, Sir Paul, again, uh, welcome, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I hope to be able to meet the promises. Uh, 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 am I, uh, can you hear me? So, because I might not be good at with the microphone. Um, I explain this uh, post-liberal term. Um, it's, uh, uh, I myself uh, phrased what 
that I'm concerned of now when looking at history education in, in a global context, more or less, or more narrowly in, in uh, European and even more narrowly in uh, Eastern Central European contexts. It's the way uh, my concern was about uh, um, uh, political leaders using authoritatively uh, history education to impose uh, grand national narratives, which the problem of which is that they are socially exclusive to young people. And um, uh, I have been now tracing uh, this post-liberal turn uh, in, uh, in different countries in Eastern Central Europe. Even if I have a big problem, I don't properly know any Slavic language. And, and uh, so I'm now at home, I'm collecting a group of people where uh, this uh, linguistic uh, capacity would be available and, and uh, it would then go on uh, with this tracing the post-liberal What I do today is first to explain some uh, my use of certain concepts like history to start with and then uh, 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 narrative form of knowledge, especially of history, and then of uh, uh, moral narratives or history as a moral craft, and then the, the concept of historical justice. And uh, then I will give uh, some examples of this post liberal turn uh, from uh, Russia, Hungary, and uh, Ukraine. And then finally, I will. Uh, I, give the talk about uh, research uh, into uh, use of history, uh, especially with a critical focus on uh, post-liberal uh, activities or, or uses of, of, of history. Yeah, that's uh, more or less, I hope, that meets what you expected to, to hear. Yeah, what is history? I adhere first to the theory of history, uh, according to which history is a wide uh, field of human uh, experience. Uh, it's much wider a field than uh, scholarly history. History is a life-relevant activity. Every it's nearly an anthropological feature in, in human beings. Uh, everybody. Uh, the, keeps winding uh, his or her life back and forth in, in time and is practicing history. And secondly, I adhere to idea of uh, a constructive idea of knowledge. Even historians, in my view, they, are, uh, they uh, make history, they write history uh, within the const constraints of their time and their culture. So this positivistic idea that the historian is somebody who detaches himself from uh, reality, from the past, and looks scientifically, objectively at the sources and uh, finds, discovers all the facts there. Uh, I have taken, uh, I have departed that idea. According to me, history is, uh, the past of history is not discovered, it's constructed. And the three keys where representations of history are being constructed are academic history, public memory, and social memory. And as you can see, social memory is the widest of uh, uh, all uh, the three. And it's, uh, social memory is uh, um, vernacular history. It's uh, ordinary people in everyday contexts, mostly orally, exchanging uh, their memories and, and uh, also connecting them to the, their uh, future expectations. Uh, public memory is another thing. It uh, can be administrative, I mean, uh, uh, state, uh, uh, Local authorities might produce, uh, will produce uh, public history, but so do commercial actors. So public uh, memory, or I use uh, public history and public memory uh, 
quite uh, as uh, synonyms. So public memory constitutes of uh, museums, monuments, uh, different kinds of memorializations of the past, fictional uh, uh, history, uh, films, role plays, uh, and, and uh, yes, there will be the uh, tension of public memories is growing all the time. And these cartoons, Poetic uh, show you, you are interested in this institute, with, so that's another form of public memory. I include history education within public memory, because history education, it's definitely not a spin off of academic history, because uh, history education, it uh, uh, is uh, submitted to expectations of society. Uh, in uh, some uh, somewhat authoritarian societies where there is something called official history as part, uh, part of public memory or public history, uh, uh, history education might be uh, part of this official history as well. So uh, public memory and social memory, uh, where they, how they differ from academic History. There is a difference as an educated historian, so I, I uh, admit that. Uh, there this narrative form flourishes. Even if uh, Dutch philosopher of history, Frank Ankerstedt, um, uh, beautifully uh, uh, explains uh, what uh, uh, the uh, idea of objectivity of history, he uh, differentiates between um, uh, referential statements. Uh, those are directly derived from sources and uh, narrative substances. And uh, according to him, uh, narrative substances uh, are most of history, is uh, usable history. History we read, uh, uh, we discuss is narrative substances. They are made through uh, attribute, attributing meaning to, to the uh, referential statements to also be called facts and connecting these facts to the story that makes sense of the past, of change. So, and, and uh, Frank Ankersmith says that uh, due to this narrative uh, uh, form, which is uh, uh, present in academic history too, there is no historian who really publishes a book where there are only separate uh, referential statements. Yeah. So, Ankersmith said, history is not objective, but it's not, uh, it's still pursuing truthfulness and reliability of the accounts. It just doesn't uh, need to, or, or uh, doesn't, must not pretend to be objective, a kind of sealed uh, truth forever. What, another thing which, uh, uh, is very characteristic to pu public memory and social memory is uh, the presence of uh, moral uh, dimension. Uh, very often, very uh, commonly, uh, so-called ord ordinary people, they read history or discuss history with this question of guilt in their mind. Who was responsible for, for something that happens? Who is, has the credit for what happened? And uh, that is maybe the relevance of history for them. So that was uh, my uh, answer to the question, what is history, or I am uh, continuing on this uh, understanding of the nature of history. Politics of memory. When political leaders refer to history, it's not uh, inevitable. Uh, a bad thing. I mean, uh, of being offered stories of uh, survival capacity of our community, it uh, empower, empowers uh, the community. It's, 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 it's uh, good. And uh, uh, what also um, uh, is okay with the uh, politics uh, of history is uh, the pursuit of identity. 
Uh, for a long time in my life, uh, during my career as a history educator, let's say, I was against history being used for identity purposes. Because uh, there is, uh, uh, it has been the idea of uh, making a collective identity or being uh, uh, in these uh, interpretations of the past, uh, it, uh, it has not been for good. But after all, identity, collective identity is a resource for the community as well. And that's often uh, when it's uh, really imposed or, or uh, bolstered by politicians. Mm. <coughs> but what, what's questionable about politics in this history is uh, 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 the use of history by political elites with the purpose to unify uh, people by means of grand narratives that are exclusive. So then they are uh, purposefully uh, excluding some groups uh, of, of uh, the community from uh, the uh, unity. Or the use of history to legitimize power by suggestions of uh, community, often quite fake suggestions. Or they use history, the political elites, for justifying a policy using selective references to lessons of the past. I have this picture uh, uh, illustrating how far uh, politicians may go in the time to justify the policy. This was um, Alexander Nevsky, a kind of uh, no, Prince of Novgorod, who in uh, uh, 1200 or something beat a group of Swedish knights at the river Neva. Neva. And both Joseph Stalin and uh, Vladimir Putin have used Alexander Nevsky as a kind of icon of military strength, Russian military strength. Um, I don't think that Alexander Nevsky he thought himself as a Russian person, a prince of Novgorod. And then about, uh, now I come to explain what I mean uh, by post-liberal. Um, I make sense of the term by uh, looking at how narratives uh, uh, of the past had been, uh, uh, let's say, uh, constructed or, or what kind of narratives uh, have been, uh, of the past have been used in different times. There was a pre-modern uh, period when history was not written, really. So, and in those days, narratives were of uh, stories of the king, the tribe, the local community. They were definitely local. Uh, uh, narratives and there was a huge variety of them. And then came the modern period with grand narratives. The, the, the great period of grand narratives was the 19th century when modern states were being built. And the narratives used as the tenets uh, for these modern states were a uh, story of uh, freedom, progress of uh, inevitable progress of freedom, of nation state, and then uh, of class struggle. And um, yeah, uh, they, had, uh, they were constructed, these uh, narratives, uh, by big historians in Britain, by uh, nearly all European states, nation states in their making, uh, and then by uh, uh, Russia making itself into Soviet Union. That was the Marxist narratives. And all these narratives, uh, they were, after all, short lived. Mm -hmm. uh, they uh, lost, lost uh, one after each other, they lost their credibility. The first one lost was the uh, great narrative of freedom. That, was, uh, that uh, lost its credibility in the interwar period when uh, more than half of Europe turned totalitarian. Uh, uh, Nationalism, as a narrative, lost its credibility uh, in the terms of World War II, and then uh, a narrative of uh, class struggle leading to a class in society lost its credibility with the fall of the Soviet Union and collapse of 
communist regimes in, in Eastern Central Europe. So, uh, and then we had, let's say, in, 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 you had to look of uh, uh, Eastern Central Europe, Europe. We had a short period of, of uh, uh, liberal, uh, postmodern uh, uh, liberal uh, era of narratives. And then um, the, what ruled was a polyphony of narratives. This term is from Dear Eagles, who has written a fine uh, book of, called Historiography of the 20th Century. And, and uh, he reports or, or uh, registers this polyphony of narratives that uh, substituted uh, grand narratives. And it was, uh, it was, it was now the formerly uh, previously oppressed uh, groups, uh, ethnic minorities and uh, gender minorities who now wrote their own history and, and, uh, and then uh, formed this uh, polyphony of narratives. But now, uh, post-liberal happened when, uh, for instance, Vladimir Putin found that uh, in order to unify uh, Russian people and perhaps to legitimate, uh, legitimize uh, his power, he has to resort to the grand narrative of nationalism. I will give examples of how he defines uh, the purpose of history later on. So, um, and that's uh, because they were ex socially, ethnically, uh, gender-wise exclusive, so the grand narratives are not, uh, uh, I mean, it's hard to like them, to <laughs> accept them. Yeah. And then we come to this history as a moral craft, which is based on the constructivist view of uh, historical uh, knowledge. Uh, uh, if we reject the idea of, of uh, uh, historians uh, about all detaching themselves from uh, their society, uh, so then um, they have they are free to, uh, to really take seriously the moral uh, intentions by past people. Uh, in all of uh, uh, human action, there is a moral dimension. All our choices are uh, with some, at least some uh, moral components. And it was a bit silly uh, idea with this uh, epistemological positivist to, to, uh, to refute that and then be blind to that uh, people uh, had good or ethically bad intentions. And now, uh, with this um, um, post-colonial idea of history, we can now look at these moral dimensions. Uh, they are, as I uh, mentioned uh, when I made, uh, uh, characterized public memory and social memory, they are quite strong, these moral narratives. Uh, in public memory and social memory. And they are made strong, bolstered, uh, particularly by using myths, myths of guilt and victimization. Uh, there are some scholars like Georg Schöpfli uh, and uh, Norwegian Paul Poste who have uh, categorized this uh, uh, internationally traveling uh, myths of guilt and victimization and, and they find that uh, in all other places uh, moral uh, historical narratives are framed uh, with such myths and use them as repertoires, templates and so on and that you must recognize these myths when you think of uh, uh, how history of your own country has been discussed. Uh, Nearly every nation has a promised land. Things like that in World War II. And, and, and then we were also good elected people, according to our military and political leaders during World War II. 
every nation tends to have an uh, old foe, a neighbor, uh, one neighbor. And then there's a redemption, inevitable redemption. If things are bad now, there will be a redemption, as that's the law history in this uh, moral uh, sense, or uh, in the sense of making moral narratives. And then there's uh, our army, David, innocent with clean arms, fighting brut brutal Goliath of a uh, bigger state, uh, uh, non-moral purposes. Uh, so, uh, but then, uh, ah, okay. When I uh, studied the, the use of uh, history in, in Bosnia and Herzegovina after the conflict of the 1990s, I, it was easy to, to realize that uh, these myths were used reciprocally. Uh, so both Serbs, Croats and Muslims, they were both elected people. Uh, they were mutually old foes to each other. And then there was this modern myth of <coughs> genocide which came uh, after 1948 or so. Uh, and uh, Serbs were really most eager to present themselves as the victims of genocide throughout the history. There's a, a museum of the Holocaust in Belgrade uh, where uh, Serbs, uh, let's say, parallel themselves with Jews in terms of the uh, victims of, of the Holocaust. And then, uh, redemption. Ah. Um, all of this, uh, they, they're not happy with the, um, the cause of uh, uh, the peace uh, settlement in 1995, so they still they expect a redemption, and that's why they foster uh, contradictory uh, narratives of the past and uh, don't want to in they let's say customarily they refuse to even listen to us okay I, I don't want to blame Bosnia people now. But then as I said uh, apart from these moral narratives um, uh, which are in public memory and uh, or appear in public memory and social memory. There's uh, historical justice, which is uh, kind of, uh, uh, it's a more straightforward idea of uh, using uh, history for justice. And it appears uh, today as uh, high-level public apologies. Uh, some of them go very fast in time. For instance, was it last year, Pope Franciscus, uh, uh, he uh, apologized uh, Muslims for the crusades of the uh, uh, 12th and 13th century. There are also refusals uh, uh, to, uh, as response to demands of apology. Bill Clinton, uh, a few years ago, uh, at the end of the end of 1990s, refused to apologize. Uh, uh, African Americans of slavery, as he said, it's it's too far back in, in time. Um, so, but anyway, a historical justice. There's um, it has interested uh, uh, or occupied rather uh, philosophers than historians. Historians find it. Uh, uh, historians are used uh, when, uh, for instance, international crime courts to do to uh, provide evidence, but uh, they refuse to, to make, uh, make uh, judicial judgments. Uh, but uh, yes, it's philosophers, like there's an Australian, uh, Jana, Jana perhaps, uh, Thompson, uh, taking responsibility for the past, uh, I think her book is from 2007 or so. So uh, she definitely, she argues really, uh, convincingly that uh, history, after all, is a courtroom. Really? I seem to not to be too time to I, I read what uh, Janna, Janna, is it Janna or Janna? Janna. 
Tana uh, says about history as a quote. Uh, history is a tale, a tale of unrequired injustice. Treaties have been broken, communities wiped out, cultures plundered or destroyed, innocent people betrayed, slaughtered, enslaved, robbed and exploited, and no recompense has ever been made to the victims or their descendants. Historical injustices cast a long shadow. Their effects can linger long after the perpetrators and their victims are dead. They haunt the memories of descendants, blight the history of peoples, and poison relations between communities. So, um, uh, uh, Thompson definitely states that uh, this responsibility, moral responsibility, is uh, transgenerational. It really goes as far as uh, the cruise, the 12th century or so, I'm referring to Pope Franciscus. Um, and uh, he also, uh, she also uh, maintains the idea of uh, reparations being necessary. It's not enough that uh, injustice is to be recognized. That was the idea, this idea that recognition is enough. It will satisfy the victims. Uh, it was the idea behind the uh, truth uh, uh, and reconciliation commission um, in South Africa. But uh, yes, uh, and, and that's how it was worked out, but still uh, both uh, there are uh, many, many uh, victims who really still think and expect that reparations, reparations should be paid or made. And retribution uh, in Bosnia and Herzegovina um, they um, tried, attempted to have a kind of truth and reconciliation commission after 1995, but no, no people there, they wanted criminal courts to sentence the war criminals, and, and that's happening later. Several national courts, and then, then there's an international criminal, criminal uh, 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 not for, but anyway, for, for former Yugoslavia and Hart. Uh, the work is quite hard. They seem to be uh, sentencing people and then pardoning them. Quite uh, illogical. Yeah. And then there was this question whether one can uh, sue uh, in the aftermath, by the aftermath. Uh, the, personal actors of the past, actors who worked within the constraints of their time and their system. And um, there's a classic, uh, what is history, by uh, Edward Hallett uh, Carr from the 1960s. Um, and, and according to Carr, he was a kind of, he was, uh, he wrote before constructivism. So he was, uh, wavering between positivism and, and uh, his common sense uh, idea of, of what we want uh, from history. And, and he said uh, that um, it's, uh, it's only institutional structures that can be condemned. Because actors were working in the constraints of all those uh, institutions and, and structures. But uh, again, Jamie Thompson disagrees with that. So that's, uh, these are questions that are uh, uh, crucial, uh, uh, crucial in, in uh, practicing historical justice. Uh, then there are history wars, uh, symbolic wars fought about uh, uh, guilt and uh, victimization and uh, uh, also historical truth. And um, among them we have uh, um, wars around monuments. I have two examples here. In Hungary now, in different towns, also in Budapest, there are uh, 
history books about whether it's justifiable to raise statues for Admiral Port, because he was a kind of, uh, let's say, very right-wing uh, dictator of Hungary in the 1930s. And then here you can see one statue, uh, the, this, uh, the statues are very often surrounded by demonstrations for and against. And then there was uh, close to my place, Helsinki, uh, in 2007, there was a history war about the uh, Alyosha, bronze soldier, a Russian soldier, one of the liberators of Estonia in 1944. And uh, uh, the demonstrations were so uh, severe that uh, three people were killed. And I thought uh, Estonia is such a small place and uh, uh, number of people are living so close to each other, so it was quite, uh, let's say, um, hard to, to to accept that such a history war could be that fated as it was. And then there are uh, sites of similar symbolic wars. Uh, our memory institutes, like this one, and uh, yes. I have attended the one in Warsaw, and, and I found that they really, they were fighting a war against, uh, uh, symbolic war against uh, Russians uh, about their public memory. There are conflict museums, uh, occupation museums, uh, uh, and uh, it, of course, the mother of uh, such museums are the Holocaust museums that were bound in the world. And then legislation is a site of symbolic wars and uh, uh, and so are school curricula. I will first uh, present a uh, problem with uh, history curricula after the post-liberal Term. Putin, when he was a prime minister in 2007, and now as a president, uh, he is uh, running a project of a single common textbook for all schools. He says that there must be a canon for young people, a canon uh, about the uh, past. I, what I mean by canon is uh, it's a uh, the curriculum or a syllabus where there is a list of uh, topics that must be taught. And of course, uh, this choice of topics, uh, it's, uh, it tends to be, uh, it's quite hard for such a list not to be somehow ideologically founded. So, and, and in the case of uh, Putin's idea, uh, he has a commission to help to run this project. The, the uh, purposes of the canon is to show the importance of strong state to Russians and also to emphasize the Russian greatness, greatness military and, and uh, also uh, yeah, cultural greatness. And then his personal uh, the words were, uh, and that's, there's not much to be harshly critical about this, shall stress the heroic deeds of the people as examples of solid patriotism and noble sacrifice. Uh, Moscow Academy of Sciences, and that's a bit, uh, one would think that the Academy of Sciences are really defense of uh, scientific knowledge and all that, uh, but, uh, and also that, that they believe that young people have, have an idea of, of uh, say, intellectual uh, foundations of knowledge, have, should have an idea, uh, should have a right every school student to ask whether this is true or not. So, but uh, Academy of Sciences, uh, two years ago, but, uh, 
declared the students, school students, must become strongly convinced of the right history being just like that. That's what Putin suggested about the strength, strong state and, and uh, Russian greatness. And the people should be uh, able to raise a wall against other interpretations. That's not very much about the multiplicity of history, which has been a kind of uh, a slogan of the uh, polyphonic period in, uh, of historic narratives. History laws uh, in Hungary. Uh, Constitution in 2012 launched the canon that sanctions four items of national pride to be adopted by everyone. And uh, one of them, uh, this item of pride was so the Hungarian defense of Europe against Islam. The dead guys raised the war against Islam. Okay, uh, and, but already in, in 2007, uh, yes, uh, no, 99, 1990, uh, they had in uh, 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 past the history or about uh, the peace settlement of Trianon, from 19, Trianon of 1920, uh, where, uh, uh, and, and where this uh, peace settlement which uh, uh, split Hungarian nation. It was the breakup of the Austro-Hungarian Empire in the context. Uh, so it was the piano was uh, sanctioned to be a historical injustice. And that's where uh, how uh, there's a risk that uh, historical narratives can be, uh, become performative. What happened was that uh, this law caused uh, unrest in uh, this um, extra Hungarian uh, areas where there was uh, Hungarian population lived in uh, Slovakia, in, in Romania, and uh, so on. And then I have this uh, very recent examples of, of uh, Ukraine. Um, uh, they have now forbidden Soviet and Nazi symbols and sanctioned, it's obligatory now to, to uh, emit the criminal character of the communist totalitarian regime from 1970 to 1991. Uh, but then, uh, where I find what really worries me is the law, another law, related law, that recognizes two organizations, this OUN and UKA, which are notorious for the really uh, grim uh, offenses of uh, human rights and uh, uh, notorious for their cruel uh, way of uh, warfare. I mean, and they massacred all the villages of, of, of Polish people and also they were very active in the, the deporting Jews to uh, concentration camps, and now these are, according to the law, to be recognized, rehabilitated as independence fighters. And this shall not be denied, or if you do, denied, you will be sued. Mm. So that's uh, politics of history. And now I come to, to um, some ten minutes perhaps, um, to this uh, what uh, Wojtek Leszewi wanted, um, uh, this chart of how to study uh, use of history or uh, more specifically, if you want, post-liberal history politics. And, and I have four uh, questions and I try to relate uh, uh, useful materials and methods to answer the questions. Grand narratives are worth of research as they, the element of them still uh, prevails in, not only in Putin's and Viktor Orban's uh, history politics, but uh, uh, in the as well as well. So the question, sub question is who is excluded by these grand narratives? 
um, and the, yeah, so and the, the uh, materials to study that are the pu different public memorializations, those monuments, museums, and the institutes, and, uh, and so on, as well as texts from history wars. The texts are really very explicit about uh, uh, pro and against certain uh, narratives. Um, and this post analysis, and now I, uh, you might re uh, notice that uh, I refer to methods from social sciences when it's about the use of history, uh, the classical historical methodology. It's not very useful. At least it has to be, let's say, uh, uh, added some uh, uh, ideas of uh, uh, social science uh, methodology. And one uh, very popular in the 1990s was uh, the discourse analysis. And it, uh, for instance, uh, through it, uh, you might uh, uh, be able to expose the chains of meaning to narratives. Now I tell you an anecdote. Uh, I had a kind of Polish uh, former student of mine uh, met me in Helsinki and we had uh, arranged to meet at the statue of Alexander II, the Russian Tsar, 19th century. Uh, Alexander II is a part of the Finnish national grand narrative. Uh, all the other, let's say, uh, monuments and the remains uh, Reminders of the Russian period were uh, removed with the independence in 1917 80. But this was uh, allowed to stay, and it's perhaps the most monumental place in Helsinki. As he was very kind to Finns, he let Finns to restore their uh, parliament, and he let the Finnish language to be declared as an official language and all that. So the Polish student stood there and just what is this blood tsar doing here? Mm -hmm. And for Poland, yeah, the meaning was totally opposite. At the same, exactly the same year, Alexander the Great opened the uh, parliament or the right of the former states in Helsinki. So he uh, organized a massacre in, in Poland to uh, repress the national uprising, uprising there. So that was a blood star. And, uh, by no uh, a liberal benefactor uh, contradiction. Uh, sensitive topics. Uh, when tracing a grand narrative, you will find uh, look, uh, having your perhaps informed perspective, you might find that uh, there are sensitive topics avoided or then uh, perhaps uh, promoted there. Uh, second question, power and pers persuasion. Yes. Uh, so that can be traced in history laws. And in this case, and also by national memory institutes, um, you can, in this case, you need the historical method. Uh, you have to, uh, in order to see the mean in over law or an institute, you have to uh, study or look at uh, the process of starting, of establishing it, the inten intentions and the discussion around it. So, and that, that's how the meaning of laws for an institute becomes uh, founded. Uh, school curricula. And um, these canons uh, are worth of content analysis. It's very often today there are no lists of uh, uh, contents in history, but, but if there is, so it's quite interesting. And they are, in fact, even in Denmark, they wanted to restore a canon at them, as they thought that oh, it would be important for Danish young people to, to uh, have some, to share historical information. So we need to know this, but it was uh, as soon as they uh, started to build the canon, uh, enormous uh, kind of. Uh, Big history war starting about them because they are morally and uh, ideologically loaded. Yes. 
the new topics. Uh, about moral practice of East, yes, conflict museums, uh, like occupation museums in the Baltic uh, countries. Uh, they and uh, the textbooks, if then submitted to intertextual analysis, you will find the relationship between uh, historiography and uh, perhaps the museum, uh, let's say, uh, the museum, the museum represents itself in their guidebook and also going further with intertextual analysis, uh, um, you might find, you might look at the discussion around these conflict museums. They often cause debates, say, about uh, uh, textbooks. Textbooks, uh, they are, can be in their textually related to curricula and also further back to historiography and that then and there. Closed. Social media today are a very uh, interesting material. It's unbelievable how, uh, let's say, uh, uh, old people are in uh, expressing their historical bias in social media. So, we really want to know. The best, that goes to, to uh, what is the last, the fifth point, is the reception of uh, history. And uh, that's a very interesting uh, field of research. Uh, how people reserve, uh, re receive history. Um, uh, interviews of people, so-called ordinary people, um, are very, very, uh, they are necessary if you really find, want to find out what people need with their uh, interpretation, with what they say, their history talk. Um, because it just, uh, uh, if you look at social media, there's just that phrase, but you can't ask, what do you, did you really mean? What about if, yeah, yeah, uh, and so on. And that could be the possible uh, when interviewing people. And especially interviewing teachers, I found that in, in Estonia in the early 1990s. And there seemed to be a kind of interesting uh, policy or uh, view of history as double talk. Teachers, uh, they, uh, uh, they relied on their pupils having the right history from national Estonia point of view at home. And now the teachers, uh, either they then spoke uh, out what was uh, in the textbook and what was uh, uh, commanded in the curriculum, which was, uh, say, signed or, or uh, approved in Moscow. Or then what the teachers did, they told the students, okay, it's time for a break, and, and so why wouldn't you just read this thing about deportations or annexation in 1914 or at all in your They didn't want to, to, to tell lies. Um, yeah, and myths, deconstruction of myths. Uh, when studying the use of history or also history politics, it's, it's uh, vital. Um, and as uh, you need at least to disclose the reciprocity of uh, myths used by the parties of a conflict to make it possible for the parties to, to come together and, and uh, uh, discuss openly, that have, have a dialogue about history. Um, political rhetoric is full of myths and uh, discourse, uh, discourse analysis again would uh, uh, tell you or show you what the repertoires and templates for uh, historical narratives used in political rhetoric are. And then, of course, in, again, in social memory and, and oral history, you have uh, 
rich stone of mythical, mythically framed stones that they had. So this was uh, this fight uh, with their uh, corresponding research materials and research methods. My suggestion is for my project at home, and I perhaps go no, possible on the or future research as well.